GM announces a new and very interesting engine for their 1500 Silverado pickup truck. We drive the redesigned Jetta, and we take your questions, including a great one on hot hatchbacks, next on Talking Cars. Welcome back. I'm Mike Quincy. I'm Ryan Pudlikowski. And I'm Mike Monosolo. So the big news in the truck world today, and that is near and dear to all of our hearts, comes from General Motors. They've got some engine news for their 1500 Silverado. Mike, can you take us through it? Yeah, so uh, they announced that uh, for the 2019 uh, Silverado 1500, there's going to be a 2.7 liter four-cylinder turbo, which is actually going to replace the previous 4.3 liter V6. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this is big news because you know, we saw Ford do this with their EcoBoost V6. Uh, that was really, you know, an alternative to a V8. But now, uh, you know, GM's going smaller, a 2.7 liter four-cylinder turbo with uh, 310 horsepower and 348 pound-feet of torque. I mean, torque is what they're all talking about. Torque is what they're talking about, made it to an eight-speed automatic transmission. So, you know, with the Ford, you know, the question was, would buyers like this V6 instead of a V8? Turned out they love it. And the ones we've had here, we've had several F-150s with both the 2.7 liter V6 EcoBoost and the 3.5. And it's a fantastic drivetrain. But the question is, how, and we don't know yet because this is just announced, right. but how will people take to a, a small turbo four in a full size Silverado 1500, that's the big question. Right, and, and we were skeptical with the Ford engines. Yeah, well, the, the truck guys are going to squawk at this right away. Um, they did when the, they did, uh, Ford did the six, uh, yeah, the six cylinder EcoBoost motors, and they're taking a liking to it now. Um, I mean, there's still the diehards that need a V8 noise, but. Um, but but, but in, our, in our testing, we found that oh, it was, the, the F 150 is spectacular. Strong, yeah, right. decent fuel economy, towed well. Well, the, the three, other thing is to keep in mind this is replacing the V6. Oh, that was which an, is, that was an which is not too. really a, right. you know, if you're a true truck guy, you really want a V8 or a diesel, right. or in this case, you know, uh, the EcoBoost V6. Right. So I think that it's probably going to be a win-win. I mean, the fuel economy is, is rumored to be really good, especially mm -hmm. the highway fuel economy, mm -hmm. partially because this engine, this new turbo engine with them is going to be their first use of cylinder deactivation. Good point. I, was, I read that. Yes. That's right. Potentially in a, in a four means... Cylinder, in a four-cylinder. Right. First use of cylinder deactivation. So it's going to be running as a two-cylinder two in times. certain light yeah. load situations. It's like, it's like a motorcycle engine. Is, you know? Which I assume it's, is, you know, in highway situations where you're just kind of cruising along, right. Right. Uh, it's going to switch to two cylinders. Yeah, so this, that's why th that's why this rumored impressive right. highway fuel economy mm -hmm. is probably going to come true. Yeah, this is a uh, great example of modern engineering. I mean, this motor has variable valve t uh, timing. Um, the cylinder deactivation on a four-cylinder, which yeah. seems crazy to me, but um, yeah. there's all sorts of stuff that they, you know, the. Uh, tip, the the four-cylinder turbo motor was always um, it's been around for a while, but it was always you know delayed uh, power because of turbo lag or right. um, not a desirable power uh, delivery, especially for a truck because you want torque down low. Right, right. And now they're gonna they can they can put the power band wherever they want, however they want. Well, and that's where the 348 pound-feet of torque comes in. Yeah. that's a decent amount of torque for a small, relatively small four-cylinder engine. Right. And, Actually, and GM, I guess GM says this is designed for a truck. Yeah. In, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, they, they talked about this, this. It's going to be quick. The engine is physically lighter. Right. Yeah. So, the, the truck uh, they're claiming is going to weigh 380 pounds less than the current Silverado with the V6. And they're claiming also zero to 60 miles per hour in less than seven seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, That's pretty good. All of those are, are pretty good. So for the average person that buys a truck nowadays, they, when they buy the you know crew cab with a short bed, they're using it like an SUV. This is probably plenty of motor. Most people are going to walk, say four cylinder turbo, it's not going to have the power, blah, blah, blah. But I think for most people, it's probably fine. If you're not I, hauling right. a huge trailer or doing crazy stuff with it, I think it's a good I think option. a big part of it actually Maybe. will be, what does it sound like? You know, because yeah. there, there are oh, some yeah. turbo fours out there. And how does it perform, really? Don't sound that great. Absolutely. Good point. Uh, it's not easy to make a turbo four cylinder sound really good. Right. Uh, you know, Ford, again, with the V6, has done a fantastic job making that thing sound mm -hmm. uh, pretty burly. Um, so and, what will this end up sounding like? And like you said, what's the drivability going to be like? Right. My guess is with all that torque, uh, it's going to be really good. Well, and it's, it's a relatively large displacement. For a four-cylinder, yeah, four, yeah, exactly. It's a small engine so, yeah. for a full-size pickup, right. but for a four-cylinder, 2.7 liters, it's pretty big. And, and yeah. sometimes the smoothness of four-cylinders don't, don't really match yeah. the smoothness of a V6 or right. a V8. Right. We'll certainly see what the marketplace says. The marketplace says the F-150 V6s are selling really well. Uh, we haven't driven the new Silverado. Can't wait to give it a try. And we'll certainly let you know when we get some information on the new Silverado as well as this four-cylinder engine. 
But the next item in the news is uh, Fiat Chrysler uh, announced their five-year plan that involved a lot more electrification. Uh, let's see, we're talking about connectivity, automation, but perhaps the biggest news in Chrysler's uh, press conference was what they're doing with Jeep. They're talking about a Jeep subscription service, and Ryan, can you get us up to speed on that? Yeah, so uh, Jeep's gonna follow suit with uh, many other manufacturers, such as BMW, Cadillac, uh, Hyundai, Lincoln, um, even Porsche and Volvo now have uh, are going to offer a subscription service. So you're basically going to be able to um, rent this vehicle, a different vehicle, for a week at a time, maybe a month at a time. Um, it's it's interesting because I was brought up, um, <laughs> my father and my parents always, you bought a car, you paid it off in five years, and you kept it until the, well, up here, the New England salt right. on the roads rotted it out. Right. Um, but the, uh, the younger generation, I think, they look at this differently. It's almost like a cell phone um, nowadays. You kind of, you basically rent this thing from right. the, the um, you know, this provider. Um, yeah, apparently, apparently uh, young people today have commitment issues. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been told by several of my ex-girlfriends that I, track I, have, <laughs> yeah, I have some commitment issues, but I'll tell Both you, these guys where I don't worry. have commitment issues <laughs> is with uh, my motorcycles and my truck. I mean, right. I hold on to those things like yeah. grim death, you know, so it's, it's a totally different story. It's a you different know, mentality. Yeah, like right. I, I want to keep my, my, my vehicles, right. you know, for a long time and, and enjoy them. But, I mean, I can understand where they're going with this because oh, I think it's brilliant. I, yeah. And for some people it would be brilliant. And I'm going to steal a quote from Jake. This is a perfect example for someone to get into that. That's a Jeep Wrangler. People want to drive that for a weekend or go somewhere fun for a couple of days with it. They don't want to commute to that to work every day on that thing. It's a it's a rough riding, oh, and, uh, and not comfor as comfortable as something else. I mean, we just talked about pickup trucks, right. but pickup trucks are also going to be another one of these vehicles. Yeah, from you need FCA. a truck for a weekend. Right, so you could get a Ram. Borrow. You, could, you could borrow a Ram right. if you needed to go pick up, you know, exactly. some big appliance or something. Or you could theoretically, you know, switch to an Alfa Romeo if you were going on a, a, you know, trip, on a trip or something. Or something. Yeah. So, I mean, it's in that way, it's kind of neat. I mean, yeah. um, it'll be interesting to see. Like you said, there are several of these subscription models that are now out there. Right. Some of them are like the Porsches is quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, you know, Volvo has one with their XC40, which isn't anywhere near as expensive, but it seems like you don't get to switch off as to as many vehicles or maybe any vehicles. Right. But that, they cover the insurance and yeah. all this kind of stuff. So some it should, interesting should be things. Easy. Right. Theoretically. And right. and you know, the I think the ones where you get to switch different types of vehicles, so it helps if, you know, this works really well because because you've got FCA Chrysler has so many different types it's, of vehicles. It's, yeah. If it's a if it's a manufacturer that mostly only has cars and maybe some SUVs, maybe that isn't quite as alluring. But if you can right. like get a pickup one weekend, a Wrangler another weekend, yeah, and yeah, yeah. an Alfa Romeo another weekend. Now again, limited um, information so far on right. what it's going to cost and right. how many, how often, and how many different vehicles they can switch to. But it seems kind of interesting. It's kind of an evolution because you talk about growing up, you, you, got, a, you got a car loan, mm -hmm. you paid it off, you drove it as long as you can. And then later on, uh, as the decades went on, there was more emphasis on leasing for some right, people. Right. You have a business, there's tax advantages to mm -hmm. leasing. Right. And now we're at the point of car ownership that is you're borrowing stuff. Right. Uh, my, my, my thought about this, and according to my notes, I, have, I wrote down bad rental. I mean, because you know when you, when, you, when you go and you rent a car, mm -hmm. you never know exactly what kind of shape it's going to be. And my right. family and I went on a, a vacation in Florida where we were into the Jetta and had like 40,000 miles on it, which for wow. a rental is huge. Yeah. The suspension was shot. The front end <laughs> shook. So I'm wondering, you know, how, 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 is, much, how yeah. much quality control uh, uh, FC are you going to have about these? Because they're going to be circulating in and out, and, right. and your neighbor's going to, you know, one, one weekend have the Jeep, and, and you're going to have the truck maybe, and stuff like, and some, someone else rents the vehicle a month later. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are, are they going to, you know, keep these from falling apart? So I wonder on their end how it's going to work yeah. out. There's a lot it's, of questions yeah. at this point. This particular one doesn't, I think it's called Jeep Wave or something like that, doesn't start until 2019. Right. Um, so it's not available yet, but yeah. you know it'll be interesting to see uh, how it all plays out and mm -hmm. how many options you really have. And like you said, what kind of shape are these vehicles, and how do you get into these vehicles? I mean, right. you know, so you drive. Where do you drive? Do you drive the dealer? Where do you? How do you switch off the different vehicles? Yeah, right. is there a limit on mileage? Exactly. Um, or how many times I, you can switch? Yeah, I, I had a thought. It was kind of neat. Is if you are looking to buy a new vehicle and you could do this for maybe a year, you could try out a bunch of different vehicles, and at the end of the year, you could you Before have you, commit, you really. Uh, tried out the vehicle. It's not just taking right. it home one night. It's right. kind of like, like speed dating. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, we're, we're going to be following what's going on with this vehicle uh, uh, kind of rental and borrowing uh, uh, services uh, as time goes on. I think it's, it's going to be real interesting. But uh, next up on our agenda is uh, the vehicles that we've been driving this week at the track. And uh, the one that we are going to talk about today is the new Volkswagen Jetta. Uh, it's a redesign for 2019. Um, kind of, kind of an interesting take on on the next evolution of the Jetta, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, let us know what uh, what you think. Um, so, the Jetta used to be um, kind of a driver's car. It was a, a cheaper way to get into a fun, you know, German car. Um, this car is, I don't think, is as fun to drive. It's a little more mundane. But for the twenty, I think we paid twenty around twenty three thousand for this mm -hmm. car. It's got leather heated seats. It's got a sunroof, uh, moonroof. Um, Ours has forward collision warning, uh, automatic emergency braking, um, blind spot warning. For $23,000, I thought that was really good. And it's got a 1.4 liter turbo motor that has pretty good power. My one complaint would be it's got a little bit of turbo lag. Yeah. Um, you have to kind of wait for the power. And then it comes on, and it comes on pretty quick. It was a little wet yesterday, and I was spinning tires every once in a while. It takes a little while to get rebel. used to it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I felt like a rebel, but I'm not. It's just a Jetta. But um, it's a really nice car for that money. I, I was I, I, you know, and, and certainly on the, high, <clears throat> on the highway, it's quiet. It's comfortable. Um, uh, so it would, and, and as you're cruising on the highway, yeah. you have to worry so much about turbo well, lag. Well, it has, yeah, I mean, it has a little longer wheelbase than before, so it has more interior room. It has mm -hmm. a really big trunk for, you know, for a compact car. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, overall, I, similar to you, I, I was really impressed. I especially like the drivetrain, you know, they yeah. had, they've had that 1.4 liter turbo. It has 147 horsepower. They had it before, but what's new this time is an eight speed automatic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the automatic is very responsive, uh, mm -hmm. shifts really smoothly, even it's pretty quick, even yeah. at full throttle, uh, acceleration when sometimes automatics, you know, maybe hard shifts, still very smooth, but quick shifts. Um, but you know, I actually did notice a couple of transmission hiccups where it seemed to get a little mm -hmm. confused, but some, it's, we're still in the break-in period. Sometimes that gets a little better as Seems it learns. Yeah. yeah, I didn't write it all. So, but, you know, quiet cabin, uh, smooth ride. But with you, I'm with you that, you know, this car will probably appeal uh, to more people. A but it more won't, mainstream. More mainstream, but yeah. it's, it's lost its, you know, the sporty handling and the sporty feel that we had from before. And there's a couple other things. Like, I think the center console is super annoying. Uh, it's, you know, really hard plastic. Yep. And it's, that's a common thing we see in cars and SUVs these days where the center console really intrudes with the driver's right knee room. This is particularly bad in this yep. car. I noticed mm -hmm. that as well. Um, and uh, I actually am uh, not a big fan of VW's leatherette seats because I find they get kind of sticky and uh, they don't okay. breathe really well in hotter right. weather, so that kind of bothers me. Um, but that's about it. Beyond that, I mean, it's just it's a really nice car. It's just not, you know even moderately exciting well, the, like the, 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 the driving right. dynamics that both you guys brought up are, are very similar to what we said about the redesigned Passat, yep. for example. It kind of got more Americanized. It got bigger. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. got a little softer. Right. Uh, personally, I have a soft spot in my heart for the last generation GLI. Yeah, uh, we, fun, we tested sure. it with a yeah. manual transmission. Right. I always thought that was kind of uh, a poor person's uh, BMW yep. and uh, BMW 3 Series, I should say. Right. And and it, I've, obviously the emphasis on manual transmissions is, is is getting less and less. And the edginess of Volkswagens in general right. also has gotten a bit soft. Maybe not on, so much poor person, someone who just wants to spend less money. Uh, well, a frugal a, person. A, 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 frugal a budget person. 3 Series. How about yeah. that? Yeah. But, this uh, isn't but, uncommon, though, for... A lot of cars nowadays, they're all getting a little bigger, a little right, softer. Right. They're getting Americanized. But, it's, so it, right. so he, here's the thing. So let's say this car does really well for Volkswagen and they sell more and more of them. Mm -hmm. That means, you know, it, th that's the way they're going to build their cars. If, right. if, if more people like it with this sort of, you know, yeah. sort of dumbed down, whatever you want to call it, you know, kinder, gentler Jetta. Well, they well, accomplished the their goals. The, yeah. They accomplished their right. goals. Yeah. But the people who liked the previous Jettas because it was kind of like this... Mm -hmm cheaper cheap way to get into a uh you know a, a sporty compact sedan that's going to go away right. and that's yeah. that's kind of a bummer for the people who like the jetta for that right. you know so now we're going to move on to the questions part of this program and we love getting them keep sending us the video clips and your text to talking cars at icloud.com that's talking cars at icloud.com the first question up has to do with reliability I wish your reliability survey was better at distinguishing true faults from issues that survey respondents don't like. Toyota's infotainment system is largely horrible, but it works. It doesn't die, crash, crack, or break. I would rate it reliable, but poorly designed. 
Such issues are completely different from something like transmission failed at 10,000 miles, leaving the car undrivable. I want to know how many days the car might spend in the shop, not whether or not the driver could or could not figure out the infotainment or other controls. Now, this is a great question because it really plays in to what we do here at Consumer Reports, and that's a whole lot of surveys. Now, Mike, what, what kind of answer do, do you have for this person? Well, uh, first of all, you know, this is one of the things I like about the podcast is it lets us uh, clear up misconceptions that people might have about the way we do things, where how we get you know, our reliability data, how we get our owner, satis- owner satisfaction data. Um, and so I think this person maybe is confusing a little bit the difference between reliability and owner satisfaction. You know, reliability is we ask, you know, or, or owner sat, we ask uh, the uh, members, would they buy this car again if they had it to do all over again? And that's how we get that owner satisfaction mm-hmm. rating. And then with reliability, it's simply how many problems have you had during the previous 12 months because of cost, failure, safety, or downtime. So there shouldn't be uh, an overlap between you know, owner satisfaction and, and uh, reliability. One, one might not have anything to do with that. Exactly. The other. When they're saying that uh, the reliability of the infotainment system is bad, it's because they had some problems with it. It's not that they didn't like it. We're mm-hmm. asking right. them, did they have problems with it where it had to be taken back to the dealer? You know, did it malfunction in some way? But it's, I want to kill this fly. <laughs> uh, but, but owner satisfaction. The hazards of this job. Owner satisfaction is what comes in. That's when we find out, did they like that system or did they not? And the person's right that, you know, uh, Lexus and Toyota, specifically Lexus right. uh, infotainment systems, mm-hmm. get very, uh, you know, lower owner satisfaction scores because they're so frustrating to use. But if you look at the reliability, they work. Uh, they work. The screens aren't freezing. Right, right, the system right. isn't, right. isn't yeah. crashing. And yeah. so, so, there isn't, there shouldn't be confusion between those two. You know, mm-hmm. they're the, the people who are taking the surveys for us, they're answering the right questions. They're answering it in the right way. Right. I, I don't know if this person's getting a little confused, but you know, we were talking earlier and you know, we were talking about, the, you and I were talking earlier before the show, like a good example is a Corvette. You know, a Corvette right. uh, has a top rating for owner satisfaction, right. yet the lowest rating for predicted reliability, because right. <laughs> people love driving their Corvettes. Right. And, and, Broken and I, or not. And I, yeah. <laughs> and I thought this was going to be a Tesla-free show, but I have to drag it right back. Model X. <laughs> Model X. Yeah. The, the Tesla Model X Model also X, yeah. is another one of those cars where uh, the, the, our, our members have reported lots of problems with it. Right. But they love it. Yeah, yeah they, gave the wow it, factor they gave it like the driving. highest owner satisfaction score possible, mm-hmm. yet the lowest, which is much worse than average, for predicted reliability, right. because they had, uh, you know, just certain things like the climate system was was uh, really bad. There was some uh, we call it body hardware was much worse than average. So there was mm-hmm. a bunch of things on that car that uh, owners found problems with. Now, again, not in the way that they worked, but in that mm-hmm. they weren't uh, reliable. Right. All right. So so really, we, we really we really do cover this, and and it's a great question. I really like that one. Uh, moving on to the next one. And this one uh, is near and dear to all of our hearts, and you'll see why. <laughs> I'm debating between three 2018 cars with manual transmissions. Yay. All right. The Ford Focus RS, Honda Civic Type R, or the Volkswagen Golf R. I would appreciate your opinions on these performance cars, which would also serve as my everyday driver. Also, can any of these cars fit a road bike with both one or no wheels on the bike? Thanks. Well, Ryan, <laughs> someone who this is a likes great, great question, by the way. Sporty hatchbacky cars. Yes, um, hatchbacky. Eh, it's a word. It's a word. Yeah, okay. It's a word now. It is today. Um, all right, l- lay it out for us. So, uh, Focus yeah. RX, Civic Type R, Golf R. Um, all three are a blast to drive. Uh, I think Mike would agree. Mm-hmm. Um, Both Mike's. Would I'll agree. start. I'll, I'll kind of. I'll. Here's what I'll do. I'll kind of. What's break. your choice? I'll, I'm gonna. I'll say that. Oh, okay. Say that for the end. Okay. I'm gonna break them mystery, down. Mystery. Kind of just give you a quick overview it's here. Tease. Civic Type R is front wheel drive. I don't know if he's concerned with uh, all, all or um, you know front wheel drive. Mm-hmm. Um, Civic Type R is raw. It's pretty rough. Um, it's probably the most extreme, I would say. Would you agree? Yeah, it's um, really designed. It seems of the three, really designed for the track for doing yeah. track days. It's right. fast. It's uh, it's stiff mm-hmm. um, for everyday driving. He d- he does say everyday driving. Um, 
I think it's a little much for everyday driving. Sure. Um, it's a hatchback though. You could definitely get, the, I think, that, get the bike in there with, that, with the front wheel off. Yeah. Um, we'd have to flip the seats and yeah. maybe jockey it in there a little bit. Um, the Focus RS is maybe a step down from um, as raw. The raw the edgy yeah, but it's, um, it's all wheel drive. Um, my complaint with that car is the seats, the Recaro's front seats are real aggressive. Yeah. For every day getting in and out, oh, yeah. in and out of it is yeah. um, quite a chore. A blast to drive. That's, that's a really fun car. Um, the Golf R, I would say, is the most livable. Um, it's a little bit softer, a little easier to drive every day. The seats are a little more normal, I would say. Right. Um, the seats flip down, you can fit a bike in that also, uh, along with the RS. Um, you fit bikes in all of these. I think I'd put a bike rack on any of them, though. I would take so the Golf, Golf R, R for you. Golf R, okay. um, Just for the uh, everyday aspect of it. And the, uh, the, the RS is very close, but the seats are a yeah. deal breaker for me. Okay. I completely disagree with you. Okay. And that's by fine. that I mean... You're wrong. That, by that I mean I would choose the Focus RS, but I actually com do agree with you that, that of the three, as an everyday driver, mm -hmm. probably the Golf R is the best, yet that's not the one I would choose. Right. Um, because uh, the Focus RS, 350 horsepower. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's basically like uh, you know, a world rally car for yeah. the street. And, and, not, and I, not out of control. No. Tor torch steer. I, I, and it's got drift mode. Don't forget right. it's got no, drift mode. I, that, yeah, those which are is, all... Which is a way, you know, you can have it basically... Uh, go just a way to lose the license. Drive and just, and <laughs> I drift around the track. The, 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 track. the people watching probably are angry because a few episodes ago I was bragging about the Focus. I love the Focus. Yeah. And I do love this car, but I just the seats are the, the actual... The, the seats yeah. are tough. Yeah. They, I mean, the, the Civic Type R seats are fantastic. Yep. They right. are super well bolstered, yep. but really mm -hmm. comfortable. The Focus RS... Doesn't fit me perfectly, but I would put up with it because I have so much fun driving it's the car. car I, yeah. I have an issue with front wheel drive performance cars. I, mm -hmm. you know, for me it goes rear wheel drive, yep. all wheel drive, front wheel drive. That's right. the ranking. And so for me, the Civic would be out of the question largely for that reason. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to put the power down, especially in any kind of wet conditions. Yep. You're spinning, you're spinning the front tires through the first three gears. Yep. But the Focus RS, uh, when we had one here that we rented, it was so much fun. I took it on uh, one of our the best roads around here in the wet. And it was just a monster. I mean, I just, I couldn't, I was just smiling the whole mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, and, but I do agree with you that the Golf R is the better daily driver, but I don't make smart decisions. So <laughs> for me, I'm going to go with what's the most fun. Uh, for me, for me, that's the focus. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm with Ryan on this one. I love the Golf R. I, I would find that the Golf R uh, very, very livable. The, all three uh, will not bore you to tears. Save the manual transmission. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, we got time for one more question. And this has to do with um, uh, tires and Subarus. I have a 2016 Subaru Outback, which has 18,120 miles on it. At my last service of the car in December, the dealer said I would probably get one more year out of the original tires, which are Bridgestone Duelers. They're aware of the low miles on my car, and I asked about the manufacturer's warranty. The car is not out of alignment, and there is no uneven wear on any tire. They said no tire maker honors their warranty on Subaru cars due to the full-time all-wheel drive system. I was wondering if you're aware of or have heard about this with tires and Subarus. Now, Ryan, one of our expert tire, tire gurus, what advice do you have to this person? Well, there's a few things here. Um, the first thing I'd like to address is the, the fact that it's a Subaru and it's all-wheel drive has nothing to do with the fact that they won't um, warranty it. In fact, yeah, that's just a misconception. Right. Yeah. Um, but um, something that a lot of people might not know is the tires that come on your vehicle from the factory, original equipment tires, OE, usually, not always, usually do, do not have a, a mileage warranty. Um, you wouldn't go back to the car manufacturer either way. It, was, it would always be the tire manufacturer. Now, replacement tires that we test here um, do have a, a mileage warranty. Um, and we actually also test real, uh, real world um, mileage which if you subscribe and get our ratings, you can then pick uh, you know, a set of tires from there that fit you, uh, your needs the best. But, but this comment that it, you know, no tire maker honors their warranty on Subaru cars due to the full-time auto drive. Mm. I mean, to me, that sounds very suspicious. Well, yeah, I mean, he's just wrong about that. It right. has nothing to do with the all-wheel drive. Or what he was told. But yeah, but what's interesting is, so uh, you know, I think uh, we all learned a little something about this. Uh, I talked to Gene, your boss, actually, yep. our tire, absolute tire guru. And I, the, went into some, guru. Yeah, I went into some of the test cars mm -hmm. and he said, look, the, it's what you're going to find is that if you, you know, first of all, tires are considered a wear item by the car manufacturer. Mm -hmm. right? right. So that's why they're not going to um, they're not going to they don't care about tread wear. 
Um, and so if you go into, he said, go into the car, look in the owner's manual, and you're going to find these, these uh, tire warranties. Like I looked in a couple of our cars, tire warranties specifically yeah. Yeah. for, so in other words, what happens is if something happens with your tire, mm -hmm. uh, whether there's a defect or if you do feel it's premature wear, you're supposed, you're going to contact the tire manufacturer. Yeah, you'd always go to the tire not manufacturer, the, not, the, not the car dealer. Like right. one of the cars actually, it put... Um, four different, because it, it can come with four different yeah. tire makes, right. they put these warranty cards in there for all four, because right. they, depending they're, they're, on whatever they're, they're, car you want, they're covering cover. themselves. But the point is, mm -hmm. you call the, the tire manufacturer. Right. And in, in his case, you know, 18,000 miles and uh, Plus only he, a few years. He's still getting another year, though, too, is right. what they... Right. But it, it's not a lot of miles, and right. I, we get that. Um, this, it, it is a, uh, a more sport-oriented tire. It's a dueler HP um, sport all season. Um, it is all season, but it's a uh, more sport oriented tire. So unfortunately, that's not too far fetched from, um, you know, the mileage you might get. It also depends on where you drive, how you right. drive and what you drive. And, and when, when a manufacturer is designing a car and they're going to tire manufacturers, they mm -hmm. say, you know, they're either looking for, you know, a quiet tire, a tire yeah. that emphasizes fuel economy. But they're rarely saying, oh, make sure you put tires Not, on that really last a right. long time. Tread wear is usually uh, and, lower on right. the list. But that's right. when you come back to Consumer Reports and you look at, right. you know, you uh, pick up one of our new car issues like, like that we have here that has tire ratings mm -hmm. in it. And so, or you go online and you look at our tire ratings and that's when you're going to see our estimated tread wear that you're going to get with each of these tires. Right. And then it's going to have all these different categories like ride, noise, mm -hmm. braking, uh, snow traction. Right. You know, uh, so then you can pick and choose which of those categories are most important to you that you care most about, and that's also going to give you the, the the longest tread wear. And right. so you got to right. figure out, okay, do, okay, this tire, you know, is maybe better at this, but the tread wear is a little less. Mm -hmm. This tire has amazing tread wear, but you know, it doesn't have as good a braking performance. Whatever it is, and that's right. what's cool is you can then pick and choose and figure out. Maybe it's going to be the highest rated tire that we have, or maybe right. it's going to be one that's you know three or four down. You, you're gonna you're gonna have to make a compromise, whatever whatever tire you Tires choose. Tires are a compromise. And, right. Well, that's really going to do it for this week's show. Really appreciate you tuning in. And as always, uh, check out the show notes for more information on the vehicles or the topics that we talked about. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you again next week.